Hello, everyone, and welcome to the August Knowledge Management Webinar for APQC. Really excited to be here today. This is our back to school edition. So before we started, we were all talking about did we bring our lunch bags or our lunch boxes today? So hopefully you came um, to enjoy a great session where we're going to go back and talk about some of the foundational elements of knowledge management and some of those essentials that truly never go out of style. We just get better at them over time. So we're going to spend some time on that today. I am Linda Broxick, and I am the principal research lead for knowledge management here at APQC. And I'm being joined by my amazing colleague and friend, Cindy Hubert, who is the executive director of client services, who a lot of you probably know. So we are going to be tag team teaching today on this first day of school, and we're going to dive right in. Um, oh, one thing to remind you of is that you will receive um, a follow-up email after this um, webinar where you will receive a link to the presentation and to the recording so you can refer back to it. And also throughout this chat, knowledge management people love to chat. They love to share information with one another. So please use the chat feature. Please use the Q&A feature if you'd like to post a question. And we will do our very best to answer those real time as we go through, um, either by talking about it or um, our other experts on the call will jump in and get those answers out there on chat and feel free to chat with one another as well. We learn a lot from each other. So, okay. So what are we gonna to do today? Three objectives we're gonna focus on. What is knowledge management or KM and why is it needed? What KM approaches are possible and how can you create a roadmap to success? And then what are some of the key roles and skills that are truly essential to KM? And then like any other webinar that we have, we will make sure that we provide you and send you away with plenty of resources and upcoming opportunities if you want to get more engaged in some of the things happening at APQC. With that, we love to hear from you, especially when we get started. So we're starting with a poll. Very simply, what is your current level of KM understanding and experience? It really helps us to make sure we can shape the conversation today to the best um, for your um, um, best experience. And Linda, this is, I'm so excited to be with you today. And it's back to school day one was always one of my favorite days in my entire lifetime. Who, who didn't get excited about it? And who wasn't a little scared? So I'm like, Linda, tell us this because it really does help us understand where you need to go and what curriculum you need to look at. So, mm -hmm. so glad you all are joining us. And my gosh, we've got this huge Netherlands representation. No. You guys, what's going on over there? Hopefully no. you're having a glass of wine about this time. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. His first name popped up was a, a previous colleague of mine. So I, I oh my gosh, that's amazing. Glad you're here. All right. What Jeez. do we got? Oh, wow. Look at that spread. We're all over, Cindy. We're all over the board. This is, this is actually great. This is great. So Especially for those of you who are just beginning, I hope this is really um, at a level that is helpful to you. But for those of you that are experienced, I hope it's a great reminder, right, of those things that yeah. sometimes we can tend to forget about when we get too deep in our work every day. And, and please, like I said, jump in the chat and offer your insights as we go along the way, too. So this is fabulous. I love it. Linda, I got to connect those experienced people to our founder, Jack Grayson. He always said, um, always set yourself up as a lifetime learner. And so those of you who are experienced that it's perfect. You're role modeling because you can never get enough of the foundations. Absolutely. Foundation. Totally. Great, great, great comment. So, OK, we're going to get started and we're going to go back back to the beginning. Right. Our ABCs. What is knowledge management? Why is it needed? And um, when we start talking about knowledge management, we first have to ask ourselves, what do we even mean when we say knowledge, right? What, what is knowledge? And knowledge is simply those things that um, encompass the experience, right? That we have and the intuition and the wisdom that we build over time. Some of it can be really, really explicit, easy to write down a process, step-by-step. Step. We can replicate it, we can document it, we can easily share it with other people. And that's fantastic. And we love explicit knowledge, right? It's, it's great. But a lot of what we have is tacit knowledge, something that we refer to. I had a, a, a leader early on that referred to it as it's what's behind the eyes and between the ears. And that just stuck with me. Those things that are in your head that sometimes you don't know what you know until somebody asks you. 
right? So how do we articulate those things that are very difficult for us to, to articulate and write down for other people? But it's so incredibly important to focus on both aspects of knowledge because we want to gain the skills and experience of those people who've been doing this for a long time because it leads to competency and it helps us to figure out how to transfer that information into a more explicit format the best that we can so that others can learn from us. However, Tacit is really hard to transfer, right? So we have to use um, varying techniques and um, we have to think about what kinds of knowledge we have and apply approaches to those types of knowledge in different ways so that we can leverage all of that for our competitive advantage. So a couple of the things I just wanted to mention is that knowledge management can actually help with both of these types of knowledge. So keep that in mind as we go through today. Secondly, is that there's some capabilities that we've really seen here at APQC with our members trending over the last couple of years. One of those is content management. And this is really important because I think this is just, it's always going to be something that we need to, to pay attention to, right? How do we manage that really explicit content um, that we have? How do we govern it? How do we get it organized in a way that people can find it? And I want you to keep in mind also that with all of the, um, the latest trends around artificial intelligence and things like that, content management is even more important because if your content isn't organized and structured and, and easily um, brought together and curated, it will make it harder to use some of those advanced technologies, okay? Also, knowledge elicitation and transfer, which is really just that pulling that expertise out of people's heads and figuring out how to transfer that in the best way possible is another thing that's really being brought to light because businesses are very worried about knowledge loss in their organizations. So keep these two types of knowledge um, in mind as we go forward because they are critical to some of our knowledge management approaches. Linda, I always, um, that, iceberg always reminds me of a diamond in the rough. For some reason, it's a new image to everyone. And so when I look at it and I thought, well, that's really appropriate because knowledge management gets to chip away and make it really valuable, right? And looking at both of those. So I want to talk a little bit about why knowledge management. This has always been a question that we've tried to answer over the last three decades. So just it's it's been out there. And I think, Linda, the first response we have to why is just because we can, right? We have started um, really understanding the processes, the best practices, the capabilities, the competencies, the skills, all those things that are needed to put in approaches and processes that allow people to help their knowledge flow. Knowledge is that raw asset, whether it's written down and codified or whether it is stuck between those ears and behind those eyes. And so we have so many things, but the, the thing I love about knowledge management is it's always sought a purpose. And yes, we've had, we, we always know there's the bigger than we want to create knowledge sharing culture because that's one of the things we like to do as knowledge managers. And we want to be able to do those things that are bigger and holistic. But at the same time, we can't, we have business impact. And these are whether you are focusing on moving from products to broader solutions and you've got to bring your knowledge together in new and creative ways or whether you want to lessen risk. And guys, I will share with you, I think that um, our risk have always been there. Do they get greater? Maybe. Do they are they different? Probably because things change in our world. Um, technology goes digital and different. We have different supply chain challenges. And so I think we're always looking at how do we reduce the risk associated with knowledge loss, knowledge getting stuck. And so being able to understand those things and then begin to understand how knowledge management can make it better is really important. The other point is I think that we are in faster, faster cycles of learning and we know that. And so we are able to be more anticipatory these days with our foundational work that we've done to get knowledge embedded and out to the people who need it when they need it and not make them wait. So, and of course that then saves time and frustration, which is totally what we've been looking to do all these years, as well as reduce, um, reduce duplication of efforts. And so I think all of these are important to think about. We can 
do these things and impact. Now, can you do them all at one time? Probably not. Pick one or two that are important to the organization and really go after it. So that's the first part of the why. The second part of the why takes us to um, because we have needs. And that, um, that begins to look at, you know, what are those needs? And every year we ask APQC, what are, the, what are your needs? What are the priorities? What are the trends? And this list, Linda will tell you, and she's told you before, this list doesn't change dramatically, but I think the nuances of them do. I have to tell you all, and I don't, I try not to get on a soapbox, although Darcy Lemons will laugh at that one, but we predicted that going digital with the global pandemic a few years ago and everybody having to turn on a dime and get things straight. Some people had it straight, but some, a lot of us did not. Um, we said, we're not going to put the emphasis on content management like we should. In other words, we're going to once again, expect all the tools and capabilities to automate it for us. And it will, but you've got to do your homework. And so I think that that's one of the things we're seeing as Linda talked about that trend in content management to deal with that top need. And so you have to recognize that. The churn is real in terms of retirements. They will happen always. We always anticipate the great silver tsunami where everybody leaves. And sometimes it happens in waves and sometimes it's a little more subtle. But there is that realization that goes, oops, we're losing great knowledge and we need to, to tackle it. And then the other one I really wanted to highlight for you guys in this list is just that constant need to reskill and upskill employees. You know, they're that's the most important knowledge asset you have is in your labor pool, your employees and your staff. And so constantly giving them ways to learn more, to take on new knowledge and apply it in similar or different contexts, that's what keeps people really interested and innovative for your organization. So I think it's about combining the knowing with the doing and taking action for knowledge management. And of course, Linda, that's what KM is all about. That's right. And we're going to talk now, we've talked a lot about knowledge and why we might need to manage our knowledge more effectively um, based on our research and based on what people are telling us and based on just our current environment right now that's happening, right? So what is knowledge management then? What exactly does this mean when we say KM or knowledge management? And before we tell you what we, we believe it means based on our years of research and our insights, um, talking to a lot of you over the years, I wanna hear it from you right now. So maybe just if you can think about what knowledge management means to you or what you're being asked to do in your organization, pop it in the chat, one word. What's, what does it mean to you? Right. What, and we did this as a, as a group when we were kind of rehearsing for this as well. And we all came up with something different, in all honesty. So it, it means something different, but yet it's all aligned. So I'd love to see what you all are coming up with here. Um, connecting people, clear information, sharing connection. Love it. Enablement. Yeah. Yep. Good stuff. Standardize time. Enablement, time saving, efficiency. Oh my gosh, this is like a ticker tape. It's just rolling. It is. I love it. Leveraging knowledge to be efficient, expanding, collaboration. Oh my gosh, easy to find. Yeah. Oh, flow. We're going to be talking about I saw about that. that. Controlling the flow. I was like, thank you for that segue. That's coming yeah. up. Processes and people. I like that too. Get information out of people's heads so others can access it. Lack oh, of sharing is caring. Look at that. Oh. I love that. That's why okay. I love not we love our knowledge manager. Sharing is caring. Love this. And just so all of you know, as this these keep coming in, this is amazing. I love a lot of these words. We need to make a word a lot of this. Yes, we did. After we're done. But we, we capture all of this information in the transcript. And in, in just a, a few weeks after the webinar, in addition to the slides and the recording that you see, we will create a write-up and we will include this information in there. So you can go back and refer to it and see all those words that everyone came up with and use them for your own purposes. Learning, there it is. I knew learning had to be there. Um, wow, this is great. Fostering efficiency. I love the word foster. It's a good word. These are good um, students, Linda. They're all participating. Great. They oh, are. Yeah. I love okay. Brittany. I love our KM chats. Brittany is our research manager for knowledge management here at, at APQC, and she loves the, the KM audience during webinars. You're also interactive. I love it. Okay. So thank you for all of those. 
I'm going to um, just put up here, you know, definitions. Definitions are good. And sorry, I hit that twice. Um, so from a knowledge management, you know, definition perspective, simply stated, I'll say, it's, the, it's really the application of a structured process to help information and knowledge flow to the right people at the right time so they can act more efficiently and effectively to find, understand, share, and use knowledge to create value. So remember the create value, that is the crux of our knowledge management definition. If it's not value added, why are we doing it, right? It's got to be about value. But I love the statement of just connecting people to people and people to content. That hasn't changed over the years. That is really at the heart of what we're doing with knowledge management. But I also think it's really important to point out what KM is not. Sometimes it's difficult to understand what it is unless you think about what it is not. So it is not all knowledge. It can feel overwhelming if you're trying to boil the ocean or take on everything at once. It's not about all the knowledge. It's about what's most critical to your organization at that point in time, what meets the objectives, what really speaks to the skill sets you need to develop in your organization, what's going to provide you competitive advantage, right? All of those things. It's also not non-work related information. So it's not the chatter and distraction that can come from non-work related information. And it's not just technology. Technology is such a key enabler to what we do. I, I understand that, but it is an integrated approach that encompasses people, process, technology, content, culture, all of those things, right? It's very important. And the other thing that it's not there to do is to eliminate roles, right? That is not the purpose of knowledge management. It's there to make our lives more efficient, more effective, to build our skill sets faster and ultimately provide value quickly in the organization, it's it, that's really what it's about. Now, your roles could change over time because of the things put in place, but it's not and shouldn't be used to be put there just to eliminate it. That's not what it's about. It's about efficiencies in the organization. So that's really what we mean when we say, what is knowledge management? So with that being said, the next important thing for us to really talk about is the flow of knowledge. So when you're putting knowledge management practices in place, what you're thinking about is how knowledge flows through the organization and what things can we put in place to enable that flow to be the most effective and efficient as it possibly can, right? Getting the information and knowledge into the hands of the people in a way that is best for them and the quickest for them. So I'm going to I'm going to give a little overview and this is our knowledge flow process framework from APQC. And again, this stands the test of time. This has been around for how many years, Cindy? Oh my gosh, Linda, I'm going to talk about that. I'm not Probably sure. um, about 20 years. About 20 years. Not so, quite. Yeah. If, yeah. This is how I learned knowledge management. And for those of you who are more experienced, it's probably how you learned knowledge management, right, over the years. So what it starts with, if you if you look at this circle, um, the, the dark blue represents that integrated approach we talk about. People process content technology. All of these um, steps in this seven-step cycle have need to encompass all of those elements. So keep that in mind. When you start on the right side of the circle and you see where it says to create and identify, knowledge comes from somewhere right? It's created. Somebody creates it through an innovation process, through the, the creation, uh, uh, through projects and, and new ideas coming to light. New knowledge is created and it's then identified, okay? Now, if you think about that, look at that share and give back. That represents the kind of culture and behavior we're looking for and able for us to create and identify that most important knowledge. When people have the, the um, the behavioral mindset of I want to share and I want to give back to my organization, they're willing to create and identify that critical knowledge that's needed for the rest of the organization to leverage, right? Now, if you move down to the bottom part of the circle where it says collect and review, this is where a lot of the work might happen from more of a KM team perspective as well. Okay, now we know what knowledge is critical. How do we collect it? How do we review it and curate it and make sure that we're focusing on the most critical, the most quality level and relevant knowledge that we can so that it can be pushed back into the organization for use later on, okay? So then when you get to the other side, you've identified it, you've reviewed it, you know it's critical to the organization. Now we get into that mindset of, uh, from an employee perspective, I'm asking a question, I'm searching for something, right? What, where do I find it? This is where you need to focus on the sharing capabilities and the access capabilities for your knowledge. So 
Is it an expert they need to find? How do they do that? How do they ask a question? What system do they use to go access the information they need? Is it a self-service mechanism or does it help them connect to another person, right? These are where knowledge management approaches will come into play and help you get those sharing and accessibility um, capabilities put in, put in place, okay? Now, at the top of the circle where you see the arrow because, and it's also called out in blue because use is really at the crux of the value of knowledge. We've created it, we've identified it, we've collected it, we're sharing it, we're accessing it. That's great. What do we do with it, right? When you are able to use that knowledge, right? You are in a mindset now of, I heard this from Cindy, I'm learning. What can I do with this? And how can I even improve upon it or make it a little different for what I need to do for my problem or my critical challenge in the organization or my innovation that I'm working on? So when it becomes used again and reused again, that's when the true value begins to really um, um, happen for the organization. So it's really about getting around that cycle and up to that capability of use and reuse and then starting all over again. Okay, we've got this new knowledge. What is it? Who has it? Where do we store it? Is it relevant? You know, who can access it? Where do they access it? So this is really a cyclical thing to think about. And it's the philosophy behind a lot, a lot of our knowledge management approaches. So flow is something that we will talk about a lot. And um, it's something to think about when you're putting um, knowledge management approaches in place is how are we enabling the flow of that knowledge the best that we possibly can? Thank you. So now, oh, oh, I'm sorry. Did you want to add something, Cindy? I'm sorry. No, we have a poll. We do oh, have a poll. Fun. I, I yeah. keep clicking on that that button too fast. Um, yes, we have a second poll. So we've we've talked a lot about why and what knowledge management is and now that the flow of knowledge. And so thinking about your organization, what might be a common barrier to helping you or to helping knowledge actually flow within your organizations? There's a lot. Yeah, and something else, type in the chat. We know there's a lot. These tend to surface up at the very top, Linda. Yes, they do. And Linda, you know, I have to remind everybody a great quote from our chairman, Dr. Carla O'Dell. She said a long time ago, knowledge is sticky without processes, it won't flow. Yeah. And she said that before we really recognized the power of those steps you just went through. And what gives you the power is understanding, if you understand the steps, you can then start dissecting these barriers to deal with the ones that are really getting you stuck. And it makes, it makes a lot of sense. It does make a lot of sense. Yeah. And all, we've got a lot in the chat going on too. All of the above. <laughs> I love it. All of the above. Thank you. I love yep. it. I don't think we had our poll up fast enough. So people were trying to, yeah. to answer in and the some, chat. Linda, give an example of knowledge hoarding. Somebody said, give us a good example of knowledge hoarding. What do you think of when you think of knowledge hoarding? Hmm. I think somebody, so. somebody said fear speaking out. Yeah. Yeah, I think so. I think there's two aspects of knowledge hoarding. There's the one where um, you don't feel like you know enough or that what you know is even valuable. So it may not be an, an, even an intentional knowledge hoarding, right? You just literally don't think that what you know is that important. So you don't, you don't share it. And I think the other end of the spectrum is that people still think that um, if they're the only person that knows it, they become invaluable to the organization and therefore they're safe. And it's, a, it's, a, it's, it's almost a protectionism thing, right? And, um, you know, that whole adage of knowledge is power. Um, I've never liked that statement personally. I think yeah. it's knowledge is power, powerful when it's shared. Yeah. That's knowledge becomes point. power when you've actually been able to share it and then create that value in the organization. So, um, okay, so here's our poll. Oh, yeah, we're all over the place again. So it's, it's everything. Um, wow, but look at hoarding and sponsorship. Really, a lot. Yeah. Trust is trust is low, though, which is that's a good thing. That's a good thing, y'all. Having it be I, low is a, is a great thing. Yeah, I love that. I love that there's trust. It's just maybe they don't know how. They don't get enough support. They don't have enough right. time. Not aware. So it's good to know that the distance and global challenges aren't super. Agreed. Yeah. Agreed. That's, that's and great. Linda. I've always had a theory about knowledge hoarding and time. So, you know, everybody always says, oh, experts hoard their knowledge. And I've, I've seen in the chat, 
you know, I'm, I'm holding it on because it makes me more competitive and I'm going to get a new job. You know, I have found with experts a little bit different. They don't hoard their knowledge. They hoard their time mm -hmm. and they hoard it for high value, um, high payoff activities. Mm -hmm. And so I think that's one of the things incumbent on us as knowledge leaders. We need to really understand that and what's going to make them feel that value, feel that uh, they need to leave a legacy and get their knowledge out there. Yeah. So you may think about connecting those two dots. If you're yeah. dealing with some of those. That's a great point. I love that, Cindy. Love it. All Good right. Start. So Linda asked me about flow. So, you know, guys, we, we always knew about those steps. What we got caught up with, and when I say we, this is the royal we of the knowledge management community at APQC. I just happened to be along for the ride with all of you. But I think what we got caught up in was the, the whole focus on knowledge as an asset, which made a lot of sense. It was fairly new back in the 90s, and we it came to fruition. APQC jumped on it, obviously. And um, we kept thinking of it as a thing. And it wasn't until we realized the flow issue that knowledge was more about helping it flow and knowledge management was more about helping it flow than actually managing it. And that took some of the heat off of people hoarding that knowledge and saying, oh, it's my knowledge, you can't do that. So that we knew that all along, but we always tackled it by saying, well, let's do communities. Oh, we need a lessons learned. Let's put in the latest IT tool. Let's do these things. And so that outer rim was where we focused instead of that core. And so what the core allowed us to do was really build on this concept of above the flow and in the flow. And we discovered this in about 2008, 2009. This is when Dr. Dr. Carl Odell, our chairman, and I were writing a book together, New Edge and Knowledge, and we stumbled on it with a gentleman who was talking about wikis. Anybody remember wikis? I Hopefully you still use them, but they were new back then, and they were talking about using wikis in the flow and above the flow of knowledge, and we went, wow, that really does work for knowledge management because above the flow knowledge management helps you set up, it helps you think about your knowledge strategy, what is critical. It helps you think about the value proposition for knowledge management and talking with your leaders, business leaders, what the issues are, what the strategies are. It helps you think about your governance and what your enabling capabilities might be. And when you're above the flow, you tend to be able to see further. It's why our IT partners are so wonderful because they can see so many things around what's going to work and what's not. And so it's all great when you can work a little bit above the flow and get some of your structure in place. At the end of the day, though, you got to pull it into the flow and into the flow finally made sense because, and it's where we went to the center circle that Linda just went through to say, ah, oh, it's people's work. It's what they do. We have to understand what they do and then how do we structure those process steps? So identify, review, access. How do we structure those in their workflows and embed it? And that's been our goal ever since, Linda. So yeah, over 15 to 18 years, we've been really focused on that embedding in the flow. So people don't have to come out of their flow um, because that's when you think they're hoarding their knowledge, but they're really looking at their time element in all of this. And so I think it's incumbent on us to really keep this in mind as you're, if you're doing a project, if you're building a program, whatever that may be, understand what you can do above the flow, but then how you engage that in the flow to get your business involved in it. Because that's the most thing. participation is our holy grail, and you have to start at the very beginning of it. That's right, Cindy. And, you know, the the flow conversation is always, I think, one of the most critical. And when I had my aha moment in knowledge management years ago, a lot of it was talking, having this conversation around in and above the flow. It also helps to connect, I think, the dots, which is for another conversation, but also how you work and partner with your process people within your organization as well, right? Because they're managing processes, which they're trying to do the same thing. They're trying to put those process steps in the flow to make things the most efficient and effective possible every single day, right? We're adding the knowledge component to those process steps too. So again, another conversation for another day to talk about that integration, but the yeah. flow, the flow is, a, is a really important um, aspect. So- 
Um, okay, so approaches. Let's get into a little bit of the approaches. Like what kinds of things can we do then to go enable knowledge flow that we've been talking about? And then also we're going to touch just briefly on how do you begin to think about a roadmap to success if you're especially if you're just getting started, or even if you're looking at revamping what you already have. Let's go back to the beginning and make sure we're not missing some of those critical steps. And in order to do that, we're going to talk about a portfolio of knowledge management approaches. Okay. And this is something we call the bubble chart. Uh, affectionately here at um, APQC. And you'll see why in just a second. But first, I'm going to just um, clear the chart for you a little bit and talk about these two axes. So we've talked about explicit and, and tacit knowledge. So if you look at the vertical axes here, the very top, you see that very tacit or that behind the eyes, between the ears information. And at the bottom, you'll see the explicit, that stuff that's really easy to write down. Now on the bottom, the horizontal axis represents the amount of human interaction that it takes in order to make these things happen. And you move from left to right, as you get further to the right, the amount of human interaction action it takes to make these types of approaches work is much higher and it's much more tacit. So we're going to walk through what some of these look like and help you think about some of the approaches you might be looking at taking. And hopefully this helps to um, uh, really clear up some of the ways you might be thinking about your approaches. So first and foremost, self-service. We all want those self-service tools, right? We want those things that are easy for people to find. We want the social tools. We want the, the search engines, the expertise location. We want um, a knowledge base we can go access. We all know, oh yeah, go here and find this, right? right? Very, very simple. We love the self-service capability. Um, takes technology though, right? To do that, we got to have good technologies in place and people have to know it's there and it has to be in the flow of their work every day, right? Okay. Secondly, we're going to talk about more process-based. So this gets a little bit more human, um, a little bit more, touches a little bit more of the tacit knowledge, but these are tools that we can gather um, specific knowledge with and then reapply, right, to, to relevant situations. So things like lessons learned. We learned these things from a project now we're going to talk about them and then we're going to put them back into our process going forward so that we don't do some of those same things again, or we implement some of those great ideas we had in that last project as well, right? They're both. It's things we learned that maybe we didn't do well, things that we created and innovations we came up with. It's also content management. Process-based process, process -based approaches are, are truly a content management approach too, right? They're, they're structured in a way, but you also have to understand um, the business, right? You have to interact with people to understand even how to structure that content, right? So it takes a little bit more of that human interaction to make it happen. Then we've got the community um, concept, right? Um, communities of practice, networks, networks of excellence, centers of excellence, right? They might be called something different in your company. Maybe you haven't started yet. Find the word and the language that works the best and resonates the most with, with your company. But what this is, is really groups of people, networks of people who can gather together and have a conversation, or it can be a virtual conversation in person. It can be an online conversation. Again, whatever works within your culture is the best way to manage this. But it's all about that shared um, passion, that shared need for that type of information. So this is a great way to gather experts from around the world so that they have a regular place where they can talk to one another, solve critical problems together, share enough information so that they're not duplicating efforts around the company, right? All of those things can be put in place. But again, this takes some human interaction. You've got to build that capability and that understanding and that culture within your organization. Now at the highest level of this chart is where we talk about that transfer of best practice. Truly transferring a best practice is, and I found this in my career as well too, the most challenging, right? It's at the most tacit level. These are your experts. And these are the people that it takes time to work with them and to discern the expertise that they have and then how to get that in a way that we can then transfer it to others. So this could be through expert interviews, right? Um, it could be mentoring approaches that you take to make sure that um, um, experts almost ready to leave the company are, are, are talking to that next generation. It could be through peer assessments. Um, and I've also seen a lot of companies and experienced this myself, knowledge transfer models, actual knowledge transfer guides and processes that are put in place and used whenever there's a transition of, of, of employees happening in the organization. It could be from one job to another. It could be a retirement. It could be someone leaving the company. Uh, they could be moving into management. And they're no longer an expert uh, seen as you know the, the technical expert. So how do we get that information captured? So it's all of those things. And all of these approaches 
are extremely valuable. And most organizations have a blend and a, and a multitude of these types of, of approaches that are put in place. Um, I believe that they're all needed in one, in, in one aspect or another, but you also, again, have to find what works best for your company. And I'm just going to show you an example. These are just some of the more common approaches. When we survey our members, these are things we see that, that pop to the top of the list a lot. Things like communities, things like having search and discovery in place, content management, knowledge capture interviews, and expertise location. So this is just an example of some of the common approaches. And um, you know we have a lot of research on, on all of these approaches and more, but again, it's finding what's needed for your organization at that point in time and what's going to work the best um, to move you to that value creation state as quickly as possible. Now, one last thing I wanted to mention was, this is based on our priorities survey that we did earlier this year about what are some of those opportunities that our knowledge managers are actually seeing to leverage within their company right now based on what their business priorities are. Now, you might all recognize a lot of these things. In fact, you might be trying to um, address some of these challenges, but at the top of this list, continuous learning, right? Strategic integration, agility in the organization, productivity, employee experience. So think about the, the approaches we just talked about, think about the portfolio of potential approaches and think about what your company's priorities are and how can you align those? If you have a continuous learning mindset in your organization and you're helping that with that challenge, what things can you put in place? What KM approaches can contribute to that, right? Things like um, communities, excuse me, communities of practice can contribute to that. It's a very um, um, exceptional learning environment it does other things like help with productivity and efficiencies and reducing redundancy, but it also really um, speaks to that concept of a learning environment and um, the employees experience the opportunity to get together and hear, hear from one another. So think about those business priorities that your company is looking at right now and how you might be able to help with those from a KM perspective. I always love the business priorities, Linda, because they fit into this strategic framework. So let, I'm gonna let you all know, Linda's already capped me on how long I can spend on this because it's been known I can spend a day on it. And I won't <laughs> quite do that. But look, this is one thing I want. This is so fundamental, guys. And I, the more I use this in practice with our members, in practice with our teaching and in practice with um, our announcement that Darcy Lemons is going to talk about at the end of this webinar. It, is, it just works and you have to understand it. We call it APQC's Knowledge Management Strategic Framework. It provides you the steps and a roadmap of the things you want to do, whether you're just doing a project for knowledge management. So it's in a business unit, it's with a team and you're going to do something, it works. Or you're getting ready to do a program and saying, okay, I gotta get this thing off the ground, lift off, what do I do? And it's got four stages to the methodology. Those are bolded at the top horizontal lines, call to action, develop a strategy, design and implement your CAM capabilities and evolve and sustain. And what gets people, I think, a little bit tripped up, Linda, is that when most people start looking at it, you realize that you've got some efforts along the way that you've been doing with or without formality. You may have put in some IT capabilities. You may have talked about, we need better sharing processes or transfer processes. Um, so there's a lot of things and people usually when they enter into this, they've got some activities in all of the st uh, stages and that makes it a little uncomfortable. And so what I'll encourage you to do is just go back and really understand it's not wrong. It's why we call it a framework because you, it helps you think about a lot of different component parts like a puzzle and help put it all together to get a lovely mosaic. And so the first one is exactly it. So whether or not you've developed some capabilities, you've got some communities going, you're doing lessons learned, IT, whatever it is, go back to your call to action and make sure you've got a great knowledge strategy and that knowledge strategy aligns to the business and people understand the value that KM can bring to it because getting buy-in, even if you don't get all the resources you want, just getting your leadership and sponsors, whoever you need to help you move this forward and you do need help, a lone person 
has a hard time, but I know some of you are Lone Rangers out there, mm -hmm. but you've got to get that business buy-in. And there's your results at the end, what we expect to see. At the same time as this going on, there is a need for documenting a plan, whether that's a big strategic plan, a plan for a project. You're going to need to say, where am I now? What am I doing? What kind of resources do I need? What kind of process flows do I need? Linda just outlined the knowledge flow process, so don't recreate that wheel. How am I going to really start scoping and prioritizing what I can get my arms around and have the resources and time to deliver? What's it gonna to take to implement this and what kind of budget and resources am I going to need going forward? And that really helps you put the pieces together and get a strategy and a roadmap. And the roadmap then just takes you to saying, well, we're gonna leverage some of these capabilities we're going to have to create these. And oh, yeah, by the way, I got to get the business involved because they're closest to the knowledge guys, right? Knowledge workers, they are there. And so you've got to get in and get people engaged that are going to be actually executing these processes, um, using the approaches that you recommend to come in. And so all of those in terms of design and implement have to be thought through and put in place so you can have a really great plan that will help you then start seeing. I always like to acquaint it to exercise. If you want muscle, it doesn't come overnight as I keep thinking it will. You have to build up to it. So you got to build your KM muscle. And I learned this from one of our members at Corning Optical years ago. Build your muscle keep doing repetitive things because when you get to evolve and sustain you want to grab keep what we're doing keep the foundations that Linda's been talking about this entire hour and begin to evolve those capabilities and it'll take you right, right back if you look along the side of cycles of continuous improvement right back to making sure your knowledge strategy is sound you've got a value proposition you've got plans in place and you're either leveraging or building new capabilities. It sounds so simple when we talk about it. It's much more complex because you've got people and culture and you've got all those disruptive things going on in other projects. So you just have to temper this, but I really encourage you to use this. And Linda, I'm gonna point them to, because I know you look at this all the time, on our website for everyone, um, you can go to this framework, and if you hover over each of those, I call them chevrons, the little arrows, it will take you to our best content and information that's in our resource library for our members, some for our um, future members, but you can get to things to help you execute that step. So I wanted to make sure you, re I want to remind you of that, so you can go and use that as a, a great tool. And we provided the link right on this slide. So if people are referring back to this, they can do that um, or go directly to the website. So um, I know we probably need to move, but I know there's a couple of good questions and I think we need to answer these questions for people. Let's there's do. two good questions around the framework, Cindy. One is um, how does the strategic framework, framework relate to the flow process we just talked about? Very good. So you're going to see it a couple of places. So when you start building, designing and implementing KM capabilities, look at the second arrow under the top where it says form operational design teams. Look at that design knowledge flow processes. So you will probably have already thought about it in your design your governance, because you need a process governance, design that knowledge flow process is then where you test that above the flow governance in the flow of a project. So whether that project is to enable R&D by better knowledge flow or capturing um, and transferring knowledge because you've got a lot of senior scientists leaving, th this is where you test that and put it into place and you'll tweak it and modify it. So that's how those relate together. Great. Yeah, that's great. Yeah, and use cases are the best way, right? Test Absolutely. It, it works best. Um, the other Absolutely. question was, how does the KM strategy and uh, roadmap interlock with the data is king my mindset in today's world? Great question. I think you, you know, I'm going to go back to whoever said knowledge. Let's walk in with the knowledge mindset. So it's hard to get to um, knowledge without the use of data and information. So APQC has always seen it as a hierarchy where you have a lot of data and that data gets turned into information and typically then moving to knowledge. So knowledge is when you finally make sense of the data and information. 
and you have a smaller pool of it, really. When you think about critical knowledge, that is made up of data and information and content, explicit knowledge along the way. So it's a combination of all of those. I think if you're data driven, you've got to begin to think about how data and knowledge intersect. And typically data, Linda, resides that the accountability for that doesn't always reside with KM. So you're gonna to need to partner with those people. That's correct, yeah. yeah. And that, that is a deeper dive conversation as well. Oh, and it's a good one. Yeah. And I know, and we do have some content on some of that as well. So um, keep asking those questions and we'll do the best we can to answer some of the questions that might show up in the chat that we don't get to in the webinar, again, because we do a write up on this afterwards. So um, in the interest of time, I wanna make sure we get through the last couple of sections. Uh, or last couple of uh, slides here. So we're going to talk about the key roles and responsibilities. So again, this is just based on uh, members that we have right now. These are just some of the common roles uh, uh, that you might see within organizations. Doesn't mean you have to have them. It just means these are the most common ways that KM teams and roles might be structured and set up in the organization. So at the highest of the list is usually some sort of a specialist, you know, focused on knowledge management and some sort of a knowledge management leader. That's usually where it starts. As you begin, from what I've seen, as you begin to mature your program over time and over the years, and the value is shown, you may get to add additional things like content management specialists or IT or communications managers, change managers, um, uh, business people might move into your KM team. The one thing I want people to remember about this is that there are a lot of one man shows or one woman shows out there in our organizations where KM is one person. And they don't do it all themselves. And they'll tell you that I can't do this without all my business partners, my community leaders, my leaders, my IT partners, my HR partners, right? So these are some of the core fundamental roles and responsibilities needed. Doesn't necessarily mean they'll be in the KM team, right? So my advice is don't get hung up on, I don't have any resources. I say, you have a whole company of resources. Who can you leverage, right? Go out there, build those champions and leverage those people. So um, it will build and progress over time and it will vary by company, by industry, size of company, all of that. So just something to keep in mind. The other thing too is skill sets for KM. I wanted to touch on this one because change management really is bubbling to the top yeah. all the time now from a knowledge management perspective. And we've known this over the years, but it's really just coming again, staying at the top of this list because of all the rapid change that's happened over the last few years. People doing organizational transformations, organizational reorgs, the move to hybrid and, and, and virtual work because of the pandemic and what does that look like now? People changing jobs, all of that. Change is hard as we know, um, but it's a constant. So don't think of it as being hard. Think of it as this is what we do. This is how we have to work. So that skill set is something that we will be continuing to focus on with some of our resources also here at APQC, as well as a lot of the KM teams out there are focusing on this. So we're going to be learning from each other, right, as we go forward with this. But these are some very key skill sets to keep in mind that are important to ensuring that your KM program is going to run smoothly. Design thinking is right up there with it. The ability to be agile and to think innovatively about how you approach your program. Storytelling. Can you tell the story? in a way that's going to resonate with the people in your organization and help them understand what's in it for them. Yes. And then, I'm sorry, I was, were you gonna say something, Cindy? Sorry, go ahead. Well, Linda, I just wanna point out, we were talking earlier in the chat about data and knowledge. And so notice that data management, I think from a knowledge management perspective, you need to really understand it, not to make you an expert in it, but I think you need to really be able to understand how your data and your knowledge and or your data, your information and content are linked together mm -hmm. to really provide that full suite of knowledge. Great so, point. Good and skill set to build. And problem solving to me is one of my favorites. I mean, if you, you know, that's what we're here for. Knowledge managers yeah. are yeah. truly, truly there to help problem solve. And just because it's a little lower on this list right now, doesn't mean it's not important. It just means that in this point in time, these are the things that are at the highest level of, of necessity, right, for, for knowledge managers. Absolutely. Linda, if you don't like problem solving, you probably shouldn't get into knowledge management. You may want to go look at something else, but exactly. yeah, you are a problem. Linda, I just want to make a point on this slide. You guys can see the data. We started really grabbing onto this about oh seven or eight years ago because of those of you who are admitting in chat that you're a one-person show, and I so applaud you because 
because it's it's tough, right? And you can't do everything. So leveraging those business roles to really take on activities is a really wise thing to do. And you can't set it up. You're not, but here's my advice. Don't don't try to make them quote knowledge management people because we find even community of practice leaders don't say, oh, you're in knowledge management. I have found that they resist at the beginning. So I think you just want to go to them, whatever their role is, and say, we want to make this easier for you to do your job. If you're going to lead a community, let's talk about how it's going to help you, help the business, and how you can really direct that to get some of your things done from this group of passionate, excited people that typically come to a community. And so I just really think that understanding the basic principles for these people, making sure that they understand that it's not a volunteer role, their leaders need to understand that, but they have a percentage of time dedicated to really helping knowledge flow, people finding things, sharing, getting expert advice. People love to work with the experts. I think that's what this is really all about. And we just see it as a huge success factor for any knowledge management program, big or small. Absolutely. And the one thing we didn't talk about as much today with roles, just because we were trying to fit as much of this as we could, was Back to school one day. Yeah. yeah, was really that partnership with those other organizations that are so yes. key. IT, HR, strategy, innovation, all of those things, those partnerships are essential to making knowledge management um, work in your organization. So now we're up to key takeaways and I just keep watching the time because like I said, we always have so many wonderful things to talk about. I'm just gonna, I wanna close with just some few a few enduring lessons and these are just things to think about, right? Um, you know, think about barriers. You're there to help barriers. You're here to, they're there to solve problems, like we said, right? Always communicate what it is you're trying to do to help knowledge flow in the organization. That's where that change management really comes into play. And and do what you're trying to teach others to do. Don't reinvent best practices, even Please. within your own space, right? Don't do not do that, right? Yes. So um, just those are just a few of our kind of enduring lessons that we have. And there, there's many more out there from all of you who have been doing this for a while. But we like to leave you with just at least a few of those lessons. And I want to find. I want to close with a pop quiz, and then we're going to have a couple of uh, very important public service announcements. So you're going to want to stick around for that at the end. But pop quiz, since it's the first day of school, we all love that, right? Pop quiz on the first day, love that. Um, what's one thing you learned today that you might be able to take back to your organization? We'd love to know what resonated with you today. And I'm even okay if you feel like you missed something. Tell us, right? Because we we may have that information for you and we can provide it, but. I'd love to hear really what you did learn and if this resonated with you today. So maybe uh, pop that in the, the chat if you can. I love that. Linda, one thing you emphasized, and I just want to piggyback and re-emphasize, is um, the change management. And Eric, right, it's not only my responsibility. That it, okay. when Years ago, guys, dating me back so far, but we had one of our members, um, chairman of one of our member organizations say, what is knowledge management all about? And he said, culture, culture, culture. And at the time I was like, oh, what? But it, it's that change, right? You, I think we're very bold when we say knowledge management is going to change the whole culture. If it is, you better understand what it is you want to change. But I think that that is just a great mantra to realize you're constantly, whatever you're doing, you are, you know, trying to impact change and get people to do things right. differently. We're getting some good things in the chat. Oh, lots, lots of different things too. I mean, yeah. everything from tacit and explicit to the importance of assigning responsibilities, um, self-service, uh -huh. you know, those basic <laughs> level, quick and easy, change management. Um, I, I love, oh, Linda. Sorry, but I love being stealthy. If stealthy. Needed. I just I love that. that. That Thank is you, that Missy. is absolutely true. Being stealth <laughs> so and influential, like you could. I love that, Nancy. That's amazing. Yeah. I, love that. um, I see somebody wrote. I learned that APQC understands knowledge management. So oh, thank you. That's that, a good. I, I hope tell so. my husband you said that. Thank you very <laughs> yeah, much. Exactly yeah. the human interaction piece too. The, the explicit. So okay, those are great comments. Thank you all thank for you participating in the pop quiz that you didn't know you were going to have. So. You uh, passed. Love that. Y'all pass. Come back. Yeah. Y'all pass. So, okay. Now we are going to end with a couple of, um, yeah. um, we've had a lot of questions coming in during the chat and I think we've done a good job. So I'm going to go ahead and let Darcy 
um, who's one of our senior advisors in knowledge management, who a lot of you know, announced a really cool new thing that's coming at APQC. Yeah. Thanks, Linda. Hi, everyone. Um, I've been in and out of the chat. You all are so active today. I just, I just absolutely love it. We um, thank you all so much for your posts in the chat, the, the comments, the questions, the, um, just everything. It's wonderful. But yes, we're so excited to announce our Certified Knowledge Manager course. Um, this is, um, we're, we're actually testing it with a pilot next week, and then we'll um, go live with it, if you will, at the end of September. But um, as, as Cindy mentioned earlier today, whether you are um, someone who or you're working on a knowledge management project for your particular department or whether you're getting ready you know or either getting ready to implement um, a full-blown program or you already have one um, um, and you just you know want to make sure that you've got the the skills and everything to support and enable that program this um, this course is is for you um, it is um, just we have we have um, I don't know what the phrase is we have it is chock full, that's the phrase I'll use. It is chock full of all kinds of um, information um, and uh, data and best practices and really those best practices that we're going to share with you all to help you develop the skills uh, to be effective knowledge managers uh, for your organizations. Um, and um, we can't wait to share everything we've learned over the years with you all. Um, this is, it's gonna be highly interactive uh, yes, you might see myself and Cindy at the front of the room every once in a while, but really it's going to be all about you all and giving you a very immersive three-day experience to learn these skills or, if, or hone what you already have um, and um, come away uh, with uh, just a, a great toolkit to take back to your organizations uh, to support uh, uh, whatever your knowledge management efforts look like in your organization. So we look forward to uh, we look forward to seeing so many of you um, at the course coming up in September and in November. And then, well, we haven't planned them out into 2024 yet, but that'll be coming yes. soon. So hopefully, we see you in September or November. Awesome. Thank you, Darcy. Mm -hmm. Excited for that program. And on that same note, I also wanted to mention that we have a couple of upcoming roundtables if you'd like to participate in those. This is member only, just want to make sure that I say that, um, participating in a roundtable to discuss the role of technology in KM. And there's a lot happening in that space right now. Think about chat GPT and, and all of the AI conversations happening, as well as the existing technologies that we have to continue to think about that support KM. So if you're interested, you can find this information on the website. As always, we provide you with lots of follow on resources and want to make sure that you know that in this deck, there's um, access to dates of our upcoming webinars. So some of them are already on the website. Some of them are planned only on this chart. So make a note of them and put them on your calendar. And the last thing I will say that I'm excited about um, is look at that. We have a date for April um, 29th, through May 2nd of 2024 for the next APQC Combined Knowledge and Process Conference. If you haven't been before, you're missing out. So please take a look at that. Again, we provide a lot of resources in this deck. So go to the end. There'll be some links to some of the resources we have to support everything we talked about today. And with that, I will say thank you. And Cindy, do you have any final words you would like to say in our Linda, it's always a pleasure being your wingman. Thank you. <laughs> this thank great. you, everyone. It was so thank much everybody. fun. Yep. Thank you for the interactions today. Appreciate it. Have a wonderful rest of your week.